Hi everyone. I'm going to be reading aloud the book Zora and Me by Victoria Bond and T.R. Simon. This is chapters one through three. Chapter one. It's funny how you can be in a story but not realize it until the end that you were in one. Zora and I entered our story one Saturday, two weeks before the start of fourth grade. That Saturday, while our mamas were shopping, Zora and I were sitting under the big sweet gum tree across the road from Joe Clark's storefront, making sure we were in earshot of the chorus of men that perched on his porch. We sat under the tree, digging our feet into the rich dark soil, inviting worms to tickle us between our toes. We pretended to be talking and playing with the spiky monkey balls that had fallen from the sweet gum branches, but we were really listening to the menfolk's stories and salty comments and filing them away to talk about later on. That's when Sonny Rapt strolled up in his Sunday suit, strutting like he owned the town and not just a pair of point new pointy shoes, and calling for folks to come watch him whoop a gator. Sonny was a young welder from Sanford who had come to Eatonville to court Maisie Allard. For three weekends straight, he'd been wooing her with sweet talk and wild flowers. When he wasn't with her, he was shooting his mouth off about how tough he was. That particular day, Sonny had managed to track down the king of the gators, the biggest and oldest one in Lake Maitland, Sanford, or Eatonville. The gator's name was Ghost, and for good reason. One minute, he was sunning on a mud bank or floating in the pond, his back exposed like a 20-foot long banquet of rocks. The next minute, he'd have disappeared, and the pond would be as still as a wall. Anyway, Sonny got a couple dozen men to walk the short distance to Lake Hungerford and watch him wrestle the gator. Zora's father, her eldest brother Bob, and Joe Clark were among them. Nobody was thinking about the two of us, but we still had sense enough to lag behind and make ourselves invisible. Everyone stood a good ways back from the lake, close enough to see, but far enough to have time to scoot up a tree if Sonny lost control. Ghost lay still as death. But as Sonny approached, his eyes were like two slow-moving marbles. Before Sonny could jump Ghost from behind, the old gator swung his tail around and knocked Sonny off his feet. To this day, I can still see Joe Clark running towards Sonny, yelling, Roll! Roll! If Sonny could tumble out of the reach of, of Ghost's jaws, he might have a chance. But Sonny was too stunned to get his mind around Ghost's cunning. He gaped, wide-eyed and mute, as the gator clamped down on his arm and dragged him into the water. People began to scream. I think I remember screaming myself. One thing I remember for sure is Zora, just standing and watching without a sound, tears streaming down her face. Joe Clark is a big man, but he hesitated for a second, a grown man paying respect to his fear before diving into the water. Two other brave men, Mr. Hurston and Bertram Edges, the blacksmith, dove in a moment later. It took the three of them to drag Sonny back on dry ground. I'll never know how. They were bruised like prize fighters, but they were better off than Sonny, whose arm had been mangled past all recognition. Back in our homes, we chewed on silence and thought about Dr. Pritchard, awake all night trying to patch up Sonny and make him right. The next morning, Joe Clark wrote to all the churches in his capacity as town marshal and gave the pastors the news. Sonny didn't make it. For two weeks after that, you would see pairs of grim men with shotguns scouring the ponds for a sign of ghost, but they found nothing. In the days that followed, Zora's father said it wasn't fitting to talk about what had happened to Sonny in front of women and children. Even Joe Clark, who loved a story better than almost anyone, refused to talk about Sonny and Ghost. Sometimes, when I think back on that steamy afternoon, I can see my own father emerging soaking wet from Lake Hungerford, Sonny's broken body in his arms. But that was impossible, because my daddy had already been gone six months by then. And that's another reason I remember that summer so clearly. It was the summer my mama gave up believing my daddy would come home. She had cried just about all a person can cry. As for Zora, while every kid in the schoolyard would talk, could talk of nothing else for days and pestered Zora and me for eyewitness reports, she quietly closed in on Sonny's death 
like an oyster on a bit of sand. A week later, she had finally turned that bit of sand into a storied pearl. Chapter 2 I am not lying, Zora shot at Stella Brazel. Zora and me and our friend Teddy were facing Stella Brazel and her gang, Henny, Joanne, and Nella. They were jealous of all of the attention kids showered on me and Zora for having been right at the spot when Sonny met his fate. All four of these girls, Brazels as we called them among ourselves, were daughters of professional men, a doctor, a dentist, a tailor, and an undertaker. This meant more to them than it did to us. To hear them talk, you would have thought they were the duchesses and countesses and princesses of Eatonville. They carried themselves like every day was Easter. Nearly all the other girls would have liked to be them, and the elder boys were always buzzing around them. And the more it happened, the more the Brazels were the focus of every eye, the more they believed they, would, they should be the focus of every eye. You are too lying, Stella snapped. You, the lyingest girl in town. You so lying, even when you tell the truth, it comes out a lie. He turned into a half gator, Zora insisted, and I saw it. I was there. Recess had just started, and our whole class was gathered in a tight half circle before Zora. Stella hated sharing the spotlight with anyone, but especially with Zora. Stella Brazel crossed her arms and smirked. Where was this, Zora? Top of magic beanstalk? Everyone laughed except for Teddy and me. We exchanged a look and then looked protectively at Zora. She didn't notice us. Her eyes were focused on her audience. I'm going to tell y'all just how it happened from the very beginning, Zora said. Don't nobody want to hear your old lies, Stella Brazel barked. Ain't that right, y'all? Not a soul moved or uttered a word, not even the Brazels. Zora took that as a cue to begin. Everyone was eager for a story, and we all know that nobody could tell a story better than Zora. I finished up my chores early last night so I could go out on the porch and catch fireflies over at the blue sink. Fireflies are so thick there at night that you can just put out your arm and they'll land on it. You don't even have to try and catch them. I couldn't have been there more than 10 minutes and I'd already filled my jar when I heard a strange whistling sound. You could hear us holding our breath, it was so quiet. What kind of whistling, Rath Hardiman asked. His eyebrows raised like clothespins were keeping them up. Strange sounding, not like any bird or person I ever heard make, Zora said, but that wasn't the worst of it. The night started getting dark and misty and the fireflies started disappearing. Soon, I couldn't make out a thing in front of me until I got near Mr. Pender's house. Then what happened? Teddy and I asked in unison. I was surrounded by white fog, but not thick like clouds. Nuh-uh, it was stringy like spider webs. She suddenly waved her fingers at us like they were daddy long legs and half the circle jumped back, but nobody laughed. Then, as fast as it started, the spider web fog disappeared. I was flat on my belly in wet grass, right close up to Mr. Pender's porch in the dark. I didn't even realize I'd gotten that close. I lay there for a long minute, still as a stone, trying to steady my eyes on the glowy light inside the house. Half a dozen voices. What do you see? The screen door swung open. Zora paused for her effect. Out of the light stepped Mr. Pender, but where his nose and mouth should have been, he had a long, flat gator snout. A gator snout, we all shouted, even Stella Brazel in spite of herself. Zora nodded slowly. That's right, she said. Mr. Pender looked like a gator man. Man body, gator head. That's his secret, and that's how come no, ain't no, can't no gator kill him. One thing about gators that folks outside our parts don't usually know is that they make loud hissing sounds. Not all the time, only when one of their young is in trouble. It's a call to arms, and it sounds like a cross between birthing pains and dying pains. Mr. Pender, a carpenter by trade, just like Zora's father, was fishing in Amherst Lake one time in a tiny dugout canoe that he had built himself when he accidentally cornered a young gator. An older gator caught sight of this and started up that horrible hissing. Mr. Pender, no fool, knew exactly what that meant. Next thing he knew, three grown gators were in the water and swimming his way. But he didn't panic, not the way I heard it told. He let the gators get close to his boat 
then threw the bucket full of fish he'd caught right at them. It distracted them long enough for him to jump in the water and swim like the dickens to shore. The three gators smashed his boat to pieces, but Mr. Pender lived to tell the tale without a scratch on his peanut-colored bald head. If any other man in the town had survived the same experience, he would have crowed about it all over creation. Not Mr. Pender. No one would have known about it at all if Joe Clark hadn't seen him carving a new canoe and asked him what happened to the old one. Everyone knew Mr. Pender to be quiet and honest, and no one doubted the story for a minute. Still, some folks ran to the lake anyway and found the splintered pieces of the dugout canoe washed up on the shore. All of Eatonville looked to Mr. Pender a little fu at Mr. Pender a little funny after that, so it didn't seem so far-fetched that Mr. Pender could actually be what Zora said he was, half gator and half man. Well, then what happened? Stella Brazel snapped the question, angry at herself for being curious. What do you think? I jumped up and ran, but the whole way home I could hear the creaking sound of a gator opening its jaws and clapping them shut. Teddy blinked. Did he follow you? he asked, nervous like it had just occurred to him that Mr. Pender might be gaining on Zora and the rest of us, even now? Zora didn't even have a chance to respond. Our teacher, Mr. Calhoun, stepped out onto the stoop of the schoolhouse and rang the bell. The bell spell was broken. As we all ran inside, kids shouted things like, Oh, Fibber, you crazy Zora! And you ain't seen no such thing! All right, don't believe me then, Zora said, but when y'all could have been playing kickball, you were standing around like boards listening to me. That alone is proof I'm telling the truth. And she beamed, as proud as if they had given her a medal for bravery. The rest of the day, I paid maybe half attention to the lessons at best. Zora had cast a long shadow over my favorite swimming hole. There's a lot of places in and around Eatonville where you can have a swim, but Blue Sink, barely bigger around than a big house but deep enough that it never dried up, was ours. At the deepest end, an old weeping willow dipped in the water like, bra like a braided head, and we would swing out on its strong vines before letting go at just the right instant. Those moments of flying in the air before the water swallowed us in one cool gulp were pure joy, and I hated to think they were over. But I also couldn't stop thinking about what Zora had said. Just because something's good listening doesn't necessarily make it true, and Zora didn't have any trouble telling a fib or stretching a story for fun. I could tell that Zora herself believed the story, but the question was, did I? By the time three o'clock finally came, it was so hot that I convinced myself it was all foolishness. The three of us had been swimming at the blue sink since forever, and with the heat probably pressing up to 100 degrees, I was willing to take my chances. I just had to have a dip. Chapter 3 Zora was walking beside me, eyeing me. You sure, she kept asking, you sure you want to go to Blue Sink after what I seen last night? Each time she asked, I grew more determined. I'm fixing to turn into molasses if I don't. Well, she said, I guess if it's two of us, maybe he won't try anything. I had a pang of wishing that Teddy was with us, but I didn't say anything. Teddy always had to run home after school and do his chores on the farm before he could come out and join us. Zora continued. Mr. Pender probably didn't show don't show his gator in the day head in the day anyway. Even though she'd had the wits scared out of her the night before, she didn't want to give up on the blue sink either. Spanish moss hung, moss hung low over the pond like layers of gray fringed baskets. Woodpecker and nuthatch beckoned us with snare drum rat a tat tat and wee -ah. Zora was the first to drop her books and strip down to her underclothes. I was a few beats slower, making sure to keep Mr. Pender's house in plain sight. Zora ran toward the red cliff of dirt over the water but stopped short, and I almost ran into her. Someone was sitting on the ledge, fishing. When she called out, her voice crackling like hot chicken grease, I knew exactly who it was. Y'all children run like you woke up itching to topple an old lady over, old lady Bronson cried, just itching. We would be lucky to escape the afternoon without getting a spell hurled at us. Zora's voice was calm. We didn't mean any harm. Old Lady Bronson jerked her head to the side, flashing us her pinched profile and her thick gray braids whipped, us, whipped between her shoulder blades like a long tail. Zora Neal Hurston, Old Lady Bronson said. Please don't tell me what you meant and what you didn't mean. 
My first two names ain't old lady for nothing. I've been round here long as there's been around here. Now get, go on, get. I want my peace, and old ladies should have what they want. Zora put her hand on her hip. Old Lady Bronson might get what she wanted that afternoon, but she was also going to get something from Zora. If you're not careful, Old Lady Bronson, she warned, Mr. Pender is going to get you. You might be a roots woman, but Mr. Pender, he can take on the face of a gator. And here you are, sitting all alone near his house. That ain't safe for nobody, much less an old lady. What you say, child? Pender, a gator? Old Lady Bronson laughed. Girl, what folks say about you is all wrong. You ain't a liar. You just crazy as a hoot owl. The powerful ones be the little old ladies. Ain't a soul in this town can match me for strength if the test don't require a lift in a finger. Everyone knew that old lady Bronson made spells. Plenty went to her to get their broken hearts patched up or to have a whammy taken off. But few got to hear her say out loud that she had conjure power. It sent the cold tingles running up my back. But Zora wasn't phased a bit. All I'm saying is, you better watch out if you want to keep your arms and legs, Zora said. You don't got to worry about me, small fry, what you need to worry. The hair off your head bout is getting uncrazy, old Lady Bronson laughed. Once I heard an, a man on Joe Clark's porch say that old Lady Bronson come from a long line of mean and kept a long, a long line going. She had four daughters, all of them my mama's age or older, and they were all mean. The youngest of them, Miss Eunice, was so mean that after she was grown and living way up by Pensacola, she came to visit Old Lady Bronson one time to borrow her mule and took the mule but left her own little girl, Billy, who couldn't have been more than five at the time. Old Lady Bronson had to raise Billy up herself, even though she was already an old lady. When Billy started to get grown, Old Lady Bronson taught her midwifery, and for some reason, Billy's the only Bronson woman who didn't come out mean. Zora rolled her eyes and turned her back on the old lady. I blocked away so the old lady couldn't cast any hoodoo dust while I, at us while we weren't looking. Zora casually picked up her clothes, shoes, and books. Who wants to go swimming anyway, she said out loud enough to old so old lady Bronson could hear her. There's lots better things we could do. I agreed. I couldn't think of any at the moment, but I was glad for an excuse to get away from the blue sink. Between Mr. Pender's gator head and old lady Bronson's juju, 200 degrees couldn't make me want to swim there now.